Native Americans hailing from the northeastern woodlands area of North America are known as the Penobscot. They function as a federally recognized tribe in Maine and as a First Nations band government in the Atlantic provinces and Quebec. The Penobscot Nation, formerly known as the Penobscot Tribe of Maine, is the officially recognized Penobscot tribe in the United States. They were once speakers of Algonquian languages and are now members of the Wabanaki Confederacy alongside the Abenaki, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq peoples. The Penobscot Indian Island Reservation, located on the banks of the Penobscot River in Maine, is the modern day site of the first Penobscot colony. The people of where the white rocks extend out is the meaning of the Penobscot's communal name, Puna Wupskewi. They initially used it to describe the area along the Penobscot River, which is between Old Town and Verona Island in Maine. Because European invaders pronounced it incorrectly as Penobscot, modern day inhabitants are known by that name. Penobscot Indian Island Reservation in Maine is home to the Penobscot Nation's administrative offices. Kirk Francis serves as the tribe's chief. Bill Thompson is the vice chief. The Maine House of Representatives invites a non-voting delegate from the Penobscot tribe to attend. The Penobscot Nation established diplomatic ties with Hugo Chavez's Venezuelan government in 2005. They regarded heating oil as a source of help. Chavez met with tribal leader Kirk Francis in New York City. Maine and its environs have likely been home to indigenous peoples for a minimum of 11,000 years. Beavers, otters, moose, bears, caribou, fish, shellfish, birds, and maybe even seals were all part of their hunting and gathering lifestyle. The ladies collected and prepared locally available berries, nuts, roots, and bird eggs. Although Southern New England had a more moderate climate, the indigenous peoples who lived along the coast of modern day Maine engaged in agriculture to a lesser degree. Only in late winter, in February and March, was food likely to be limited. Land and sea provided abundant food, and the Penobscot and other Wabanaki probably had no trouble living for the remainder of the year. Seasonally, the bands would migrate in accordance with fish and wildlife migration patterns. Because of the fur trade, the Penobscot were in touch with Europeans during the 16th century. Because of the high value of pelts, the Penobscot were ready to exchange them for European tools, weapons, and cooking utensils made of copper or iron. However, fur pelt hunting led to a decline in wildlife, and European commerce introduced alcohol to the Penobscot tribes. The idea that the people had a predisposition for drunkenness based on their genes is an unfounded racial stereotype that Europeans often sought to use as leverage in commerce and business. Pine beer was a vitamin C-rich alcoholic beverage that the Penobscot and other civilizations brewed for the express purpose of warding off scurvy. European invaders brought an abundance of alcohol with them. While the Europeans may have gradually adapted their enzymes, metabolism, and social systems to cope with a socially acceptable high alcohol consumption, the Penobscot people, while accustomed to alcohol, had never before had access to the sheer volume of alcohol that the Europeans provided. Because they lacked an acquired immunity, the Penobscot were vulnerable to the infectious illnesses that the Europeans brought to the Americas from Eurasia. The arrival of contagious illnesses such as smallpox, measles, and others resulted in high mortality rates among them. Further colonization by settlers led to the damming of the Penobscot River, which cut off the Penobscot's access to running fish, in turn reducing the population. Clear cutting of forests for logging also killed off big game, and settlers committed massacres. This devastating population decline may have made people more receptive to Christianity as they observed that European priests remained unaffected by the epidemics. According to the latter, the Penobscot perished because of their lack of faith in Jesus Christ. Europeans began to permanently settle on Wabanaki land in the early 17th century. During this period, the estimated Penobscot population was 10,000, but by the early 19th century, it had decreased to less than 500. Cultural differences, differing property ideas, and resource competitiveness were the root causes of disputes that emerged when contact became more persistent around 1675. Most immigrants in what is now Canada spoke French along the Atlantic coast, while in New England, English was the language of choice. 
British colonists threatened the Penobscot, leading them to ally with the French during the French and Indian War, the North American front of the Seven Years' War, in the mid-18th century. The French were less of a danger to the Penobscot's land and way of life because of the reduced number and increased acceptance of intermarriage, which occurred in 1755 when Massachusetts Governor Spencer Phipps imposed a scalp reward on the Penobscot. The Penobscot were already in a precarious situation when the French loss at the Battle of Quebec in 1759 severed ties with their principal European ally. Among the several tribes that fought along the boundary between American and British Canada during the American Revolution, the Penobscot were among the most prominent. They were loyal patriots. Regardless, it seemed that the newly formed American government overlooked their achievements. Anglo-American immigrants further encroached upon the Penobscot homeland. Despite the Penobscot's best efforts to secure property via treaties in the decades that followed, the Americans continued to intrude on their territory in Massachusetts and Maine due to their lack of legal standing. Beginning in 1800, settlers inhabited Indian Island, an island in the Penobscot River near Old Town, Maine, as one of many Penobscot reserves. The Maine state government appointed a tribal agent to manage the tribe. According to Maine's highest court in 1824, imbecility on their parts and the dictates of humanity on ours have necessarily prescribed to them their subjection to our paternal control. The government treated the Penobscot as wards of the state and decided how to manage their affairs, establishing a power dynamic based on this sentiment of imbecility. The state, which had complete discretion over the use of the Penobscot monies, acquired via land negotiations and trusts, saw them as charitable contributions. The fledgling American government in 1790 passed the Non-Intercourse Act, which stipulated that the United States Congress had to approve the transfer of reserve lands to individuals who were not tribe members. Treaties, never ratified by the U.S. Senate and therefore illegal under the Constitution, ceded the majority of the Penobscot and Passamaquoddy lands to Massachusetts and later to Maine after it became a state in 1820. The federal government alone negotiated the treaties. This happened between 1794 and 1833. They only had the Penobscot Indian Island Reservation left. While Native American claims to sovereignty were on the rise in the 1970s, the Penobscot Nation filed a land claim lawsuit against Maine, alleging that the state had violated the Non-Intercourse Act in the 1800s and demanding restitution in the form of land, money, and autonomy. There were 35,000 people residing in the contested region, the great majority of whom were not tribe members. The disputed land made up 60% of Maine's total geographical area. In 1980, the state and the Penobscot came to an agreement known as the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act, Mikase. This settlement, which was worth $81.5 million, allowed the Penobscot to purchase more tribal territory. As part of the settlement, the federal government agreed to buy the property and then put some of it in trust for the tribe, much like it does with reservation territory. The tribe may also use conventional means to acquire more territories. The legislation formed the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission with the purpose of monitoring its efficacy and mediating conflicts between the state and the Penobscot or Passamaquoddy in specific areas, such as fishing rights. The Penobscot, a federally recognized sovereign nation with direct links to the federal government, have resisted state claims that it has the authority to restrict tribe members hunting and fishing. The nation filed the lawsuit Penobscot Nation versus State of Maine against the state in August 2012. The nation contended that the 1980 Mixa settlement gave it regulatory power and control over hunting and fishing on the reserve in the main stem of the Penobscot River. U.S. Department of Justice attorneys have joined the tribe's lawsuit in response to a request from the nation. Moreover, five members of the Congressional Native American Caucus from different jurisdictions submitted an Amici Curiae brief supporting the Penobscot in this matter, which is a first. Along with its reservation, the nation also owns islands in the river that stretch 60 miles, 97 kilometers, upriver. As a consequence of the 1980 land claim settlement, it also gained hundreds of thousands of acres of property elsewhere in the state. According to some experts, this case will have just as big of an impact on Indian law and sovereignty 
As the 1970s fishing rights disputes involving Native American tribes in the Northwest, which led to the Bolt decision recognizing their rights to fish and hunt in their ancient territory in 1974. Betty McCollum, DMN, who is co-chair of the Congressional Native American Caucus with Tom Cole, ROK, Chickasaw, along with Raul Grijalva, DAZ, Ron Kind, DWI, and Ben Ray Lujan, DNM, are the five members of the caucus who submitted their materials. The Penobscot people once spoke an Algonquian language that was a variation of the Eastern Abenaki. It has a lot of linguistic similarities with the other Wabanaki Confederacy languages. Madeline Tower Shea, the last known Penobscot speaker from Eastern Abenaki, died in the 1990s, and no one speaks the language fluently anymore. Frank Siebert produced a dictionary. On Indian Island, the Boys and Girls Club and the primary school are attempting to revive the language by instructing the younger generation in its use. We used a modified Roman alphabet to produce the written Penobscot language and devised separate symbols to represent sounds not found in the Roman alphabet. Roger Williams wrote a key into the language of America in 1643. The Narragansett people and other tribes they conquered or subjugated, according to Williams' studies, spoke a language that was only slightly different in dialect from that of the northern Algonquian people. His account suggests that even in far northern Labrador, learning the language of one tribe could facilitate communication with the other group. People from Labrador originally spoke Algonquian, and their neighbors to the north had the same language family as the Narragansett. This was not the case with the very distinct Iroquois language, according to Williams. Williams was multilingual and had lived among indigenous people to hone his native tongue before going on a missionary journey and writing prayer conversion booklets. Based on his experience translating ancient Hebrew and Greek biblical texts, Williams said that he believed the Narragansett, hence the Algonquian, often used terms that were either Hebrew or, more rarely, Greek. For the sake of perpetuating his knowledge of this Native American language beyond his death, Williams included a phonetic English dictionary in his book, A Key into the Language of America. The Penobscot traditionally fashioned baskets from brown ash, birch bark, and sweet grass. These materials may be found growing in marshes all around Maine, yet emerald ash, borer infestations, and habitat loss pose a hazard to the species. Like it has wreaked havoc on ash forests in the Midwest, this pest might wipe out all ash trees in Maine. Originally crafted for everyday use, the Penobscot started creating fancy baskets to sell to Europeans after they established contact. Generations of women have passed down the talent of making baskets. Lots of tribe members have studied and adapted the old ways. Forest canoes. For all of the Wabanaki Confederacy's nations, the birch bark canoe was formerly the primary means of transportation. Every country has its own unique boat form. One piece of white birch tree bark is used to construct each vessel. If you do it right, you can safely remove the enormous chunk of bark without harming the tree. The mythology and deep respect for the natural world reflect the Penobscot people's long and storied past in Maine. In their sacred country, they are working to preserve land and natural resources guided by their complex spiritual worldview. The Penobscot people hold the main landscape in the highest regard. The river that bears their name is sacred to them and plays an important role in their beliefs and way of life. The author explains how deeply rooted the Penobscot cosmology is within the main landscape, their ethic of mutual obligation to a land full of spirits, animal people, and daunting power is fundamentally geographic with every place name helping to orient a traveler in relation to both physical space and spiritual power. Respect for Klosakur Bay, Glusk Bay, stems from his major role in their creation myth, which forms the basis of their cosmology. Through 12 episodes that emphasize the significance of each distinct value, Klosakur Bay imparts spiritual knowledge and practical knowledge, like how to construct a canoe, to the Penobscot. Klosi Kurbe teaches animals and people the hard skills they need to survive in the harsh northeastern environment, and he punishes anyone who disobeys his rules. What makes the white man dangerous is the lethal combination of his greed and his lust for power. That combination leads him to reach forth his hand to grasp all things for his comfort, and in the process, virtually destroy the world. Close Kurbe, Klosi Cosmology, NND. Close Courbet was aware of other races and foretold the arrival of the white man. 
The Penobscot embraced the principles of conservation and protection of Maine's land and natural resources, as this warning from a key leader in their beliefs demonstrates.